Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 yeah. Redesign Fiscal Year End Meeting. Um, we're going to make ask that everyone make sure that they mute their phones, uh, and so that way we don't get any background noise. And what we will do is we will start with the payroll uh, first, and then we'll take about a five minute break. And after that, we're going to do the USAS portion of the redesign meeting. Uh, if there's any questions during the meeting, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask the questions or go ahead and put them in chat. Either way, we have someone watching the chat and we'll also, if you uh, just want to unmute yourself, that would be fine as well. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, as you can see, the first thing that I have up on our screen is the wiki page, and that is actually where all of the documentation for this meeting is located. So if you need any of the documentation, you can go out to the wiki and then go to the SSDT meetings and training section and go to the uh, 2021 IDC redesign fiscal year end meeting area, and then you'll be able to find all the documentation that we're going to be going over today. Um, I will just talk a little bit about the supporting documentation that we have out there for payroll. That way we don't have to go into each one separately. Um, as we go through the review, uh, you'll you'll know that like I, I talk about, you know, this different document or that different document. All of these can be found here in this staff in the supporting documentation area. We have the publication 15B uh, from the IRS. We have the STRS decision tree and uh, earn, earn service credit document. We have a STRS calculating service credit for part-time employees. We have a third-party STRS AD layout file. We have the STRS advance error and warnings document, uh, reporting taxable amount of life insurance document. Uh, life insurance on reports, this is just something I added yesterday. It's just like a little sample of screenshots of like, uh, actually, let me just pull it up. That way you can see what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Maybe. Actually, let me just download it. It looks better when you download it. <laughs> if it will download. There we go. All right, let me go ahead and pull it up here. Like I said, it, it's just a couple screenshots. Wow, really slow this morning. There we go. So um, it just screenshots of like the pay report, what the life insurance premium looks like. Uh, this is also the pay report. And then like the pay amount summary report, this is really ugly. This is not from the download, sorry. But that, that's just a document that kind of explains and shows where on those different reports it's going to be, those are going to be located. And as we talk about this in the, in the uh, through the slides, you'll be able to kind of put the two together. Um, then we also have, there's an STRS advanced definition, which you could change the advanced field to false or you can change it to true. We'll talk about that. Um, these are just uh, JSON files that can be down, you know, downloaded and then imported. Um, and then we have the STRS advanced report. We'll talk about that again as well. We also have the closing procedure documents and your checklist in PDF and uh, uh, Word format. And we also have EMIS checklists. And we'll talk about those in great detail as well. So again, this is just your supporting documentation. But what we're going to talk about today, we're going to go over the uh, fiscal year end review uh, PowerPoint. So I'm going to go ahead and get that pulled up. Let me see if I can get out of this. Maybe. There we go. There we go. There. All right. So let me do the slideshow. We'll go ahead and get started. Maybe. Okay, from the beginning, there we go. Okay, why is it doing that? Settings. Oh. Let me go back, let me do this again. From the beginning. Okay. All right, so again, today is, is this is the 
uh, USPS, our fiscal year on review that we're going to be going over. Um, one thing that we want to remind you and to tell your district is it is very important that they remember to follow the fiscal year on checklist, what we talked about earlier that on the supporting documents, because if they don't, if they miss you know, a step, that could be critical at the, in the end. So we wanna make sure that they follow those checklists you know, thoroughly. And here's a link to the checklist as well. How to get rid of this second page? Hold on here. Oh, I guess we'll just have to watch it the way it is. Hold on. No. Okay. Um, so what we're going to talk about is uh, the, and the presenter view. Pardon? Lori, if you hide the presenter view, it'll get rid of that other. Hide the presenter view. Gotcha. Where is that at? Where do you see that at? If you go back to where you were. Yes. Right whatever here. you clicked on, it was one of the options. Ah, thank you. Well, that took me back to the beginning here. Although I like this almost better than before, but Usually when you do from the, the beginning, use, got the use presenter view there. If you see over here yeah, on the right. Yep, I see it. I see it. Yeah. Now let me try. Undo the use presenter yep, view. I did. I did. Let's try this now from the beginning. Hmm. Well, this is odd. It doesn't want to work. Huh. That is so strange. Okay, well, bear with me. We're gonna go this way. I like it better than the other way. <laughs> so um, we're gonna talk about pre-closing uh, uh, features that we have to do. We're gonna talk about life insurance premium payments, uh, verification of the STRS advanced configuration uh, field, making sure that those are zeroed out from the previous years. We're gonna uh, talk about the district running the SCRS advanced reports, and by staff reporting for fiscal year end and for the new fiscal year. And then talk about creating new job calendars, as well as new contracts for uh, the for July start dates. So the first thing we'll talk about are the uh, uh, life insurance payments. So if the district knows of any employee that's gonna be retiring as of June, they could go in and process the life insurance payment uh, either on their last pay of June. Um, that way they don't have to worry about it at the end of the year because that's really when it, it, it's most critical to be reported on the W-2. So in order to do that, they could just go into the payroll in the future or current and they could actually add, they have a, we have a life insurance payment type. They could use that life insurance payment type to process that through the payroll, and then that will be included on the W-2 at the end of the year. Or if they wanted to, they could just use the adjustment record for the life insurance payment, and that would update it as well. Um, tell the district to, to keep in mind that no retirement is withheld on the life insurance amount. And if they have questions or want to uh, do calculations on how much they need to uh, put in there for the life insurance payment, that is all located in that uh, publication 15B on the IRS website, which we have out there in the, in the uh, documentation, the supporting documents. So here's just a screenshot of like your pay, uh, payroll future. They could go and put in the life insurance pay type, or they could do it in current as well. Same thing, life insurance pay type would be used. Uh, another thing to tell your district to, to remember is when they use the life insurance payment type, that federal, state, and OSDI taxes are not withheld. So if you're processing it through the payroll, those taxes will not be withheld. But they will be adding the, the wages uh, or the total taxable gross wages for the W-2 will be increased. That will not be increased for the payroll itself. They're just basically using that life insurance payment to get it into the system in order to get that on the W-2 at the end of the year. 
The only thing that is withheld when the life insurance premium payment is paid during a payroll is the Medicare or FICA. Those are both withheld, which is a good thing because that way you don't have to worry about getting money from the employee, you know, to pay pay for the um, the life insurance premium amount that that is owed for Medicare. Um, the the flag on the payroll, the city payroll item configuration record determines whether the city tax is going to be withheld or not. So if your employee pays into a city and they have the flag on the city record, which is right here on the screenshot, the tax non cash earnings field, if that flag is checked, then when you process the life insurance payment through payroll, it will be taxed accordingly. If it's not checked and they have a life insurance payment, that will, at the end of the year on the W-2, be included, but no taxes would have been withheld if they didn't have this box checked. Again, if for some reason, you know, maybe they didn't know this person was going to retire um, and they did not withhold that life insurance premium payment on the last pay in June, um, what they can do is before the end of the year, they could go in and add an adjustment journal. So go into adjustments and there's a life insurance option that they can use. And when they do that, it, they're going to use the federal record to make that life insurance adjustment. But when they do that, all the other records like your state and Medicare and everything, those will get updated accordingly. The only thing is that you have to remember is because no federal, no state, no OSCI, no, if, if the city obviously was checked, no taxes are going to be withheld because it wasn't processed through the payroll. It'll just get added to the W-2 at the end of the year and they'll have to pay the taxes on it after the fact. But the only thing that they are going to have to keep in mind is if a, if a life insurance payment wasn't included, they have to recover the Medicare portion that has to be paid because when you put it in the adjustment journal, it's updating the, the taxable total grows on the Medicare record. And when you do that, if you don't have a payment to go with that, adjust, that adjustment, you're going to get an error when you run W-2 uh, report. So what the district will have to do is a lot of times districts, the, the board will pay the full amount because usually it's not that much. So they'll pay the employee amount as well as the board amount. If there's pickup, then the board pays the full thing. So what they will have to do is, <clears throat> let me show you here. They'll have to go to adjustments. And let's just say that the board paid the employee and the, and the employer amount. They would have to go into an adjustment and do the uh, tax tax, obviously federal taxable, fed, fed tax, the O1 record. And then they're going to put in, well, this is, this is the actual life insurance that they're actually entering in, sorry. This is the life insurance that they missed. They're entering that in. Now, here are your Medicare records. So even though let's just say that the board paid the employee's portion, you still have to enter that in on the amount withheld record, like the employee paid it, even though the board paid it for them. Or if the employee paid it, you're going to have to use this record and make that payment or make that adjustment so that payment is recorded in the system. So they're gonna go in and go to the Medicare record and do a type of amount withheld because that's the employee portion. And then the, obviously the date and then the, the amount that was, that was paid by the board or by the employee. And then they're gonna do the same thing for the board amount of the payroll item. The board has to pay their portion. So you got the employee portion, the board portion. So both of them are being adjusted on the adjustment record. Now, if the board pays the full Medicare pickup, they pay the full, full pickup amount, then you're gonna go in I mean, if, if the employee has pickup, I'm going to say it that way. If the employee has pickup, the board paying the full portion. So no other record other than this record, a Medicare 692 record with the board pickup amount of payroll item of the full amount that was paid by the board. 
that record has to be created in adjustment. Um, another thing to tell your district to keep in mind is that that life insurance premium amount is not included in the total gross uh, that is charged to USAS. So when they're processing the payroll, that's not included in that total. And then that screenshot I showed you earlier of that report, life insurance reports, this is what I was referring to. Um, the report, there are reports that, that provide special totals for balancing and those would be the pay report, which, um, let me go back to that if I can. Let's see. Get this ugly looking report again. Yeah, but here's your pay report. So on the pay report at the bottom, there's a life insurance premium, an NC1, and it'll give you the dollar amount that was paid. That's on the pay report when that life insurance premium has been processed through a payroll. Also on the pay amount summary report, it's on there as well. This just is not very, here, let me pull up a different, let me do this. Let me go and get this one. I've got a better looking one here. here we go. Let me pull this over. Here, there we go. That looks a lot better. So this is your pay report. Then you've got your pay amount summary report. And you can see on the pay amount summary report and the other pay field, that's where it's going to list that life insurance information in that other, other pay amount field. And then it's also listed on the quarter report as well as non-cash earnings. So that would also be on there as well. So there are three different reports that you can see that life insurance premium payment amount listed. Now, <clears throat> another thing to keep in mind, oh, hold on, let me get out of here. Oh, where'd you go? Oops. Okay. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, if the district didn't process it through uh, the life insurance premium through the payroll, they could go into the adjustments grid because if they use adjustments, they could go into the grid and they could actually do a filter for the word life. And they could find all life insurance payments and process a report out of the grid for the life insurance payments. And here's just a little screenshot of what I'm referring to on the adjustment screen. They could do a filter for the adjustment type of life. And then they could pull in everything that was processed for that particular, you know, the particular dates that they actually enter in on the filter. They could filter it by the adjustment type as well as the transaction type date. And that would give them everything they need. And then they can process a report from the adjustment screen. Um, the next thing we'll talk about is the advanced configuration record. And that is what actually right now districts or ITCs can go out and start looking at. Make sure that districts, if they were in redesign last year, that they were actually came out of the advanced, that their advanced mode flag is still not checked for some reason. Um, everything on their screen right now should be blank as far as the advanced amount, the advanced mode, and the advanced paid back. The advanced mode should be unchecked. This is how that screen should look at this point before they start their advance for the, this fiscal year. <clears throat> the district can also go out to the report section to the SRS advanced reports, and they can uh, process the SRS advanced reports that are out there right now you can see I have in bold, do not generate the submission file. We don't want to create the submission file, but they can actually go out and start balancing and verifying data for the, the advanced information. Uh, they could go in and generate the advanced positions report. And that's similar, if you're familiar with Classic, it's similar to the SCRSAD tech report. And that's going to project the days that are going to go through the end of the fiscal year to determine which jobs uh, should, it should be in advance and it also calculates the credit and it also will give you the earnings that are included that in the in into the future so what has not been paid yet but will be considered in advance that's all going to be on the advanced positions report the non-advanced report again if you're familiar with classic is similar to the non-advanced text report um that will give you like all of your employees that will not be advancing or you know that that would not be advancing 
um, in, in this fiscal year. And then the last report is the advanced fiscal year to date report, which is similar to the SCRSAD report in Classic. And that is a complete listing of all employees that paid into STRS throughout the whole entire fiscal year. That includes advanced employees as well. So again, it gives you everyone that is an STRS employee that paid into STRS for the fiscal year. <clears throat> for EMIS staff reporting, right now they're in the final L reporting period. Um, I, we have a checklist out there on documentation. Here's the link. I also have that on the supporting documents as well. We have that listed out there. But we'll kind of briefly go over the EMIS staff data. Um, right now for uh, final window L, uh, we gotta make sure that if there's any long-term illness data that's sitting out there from last fiscal year, 1920, that that gets basically taken out, removed. And that can be done manually. You know, if they don't have a lot of employees, they could just go in manually and filter the data, maybe filter on long-term illness, and maybe they only found two. They could go into those two records and just manually remove the, the figure that's sitting out there in the long-term illness field. Or if you have a large district, they have multiple employees with long-term illness data, um, then you could actually go out, the district, if they have mass change access, you know, some ITCs may allow it, some don't. Um, I'm just kind of telling you what they can do or what you at the IGC level can do as well. You could go to uh, the employee's record under core and on the grid under more state reporting, check the long-term illness record. And then that field will be available on the grid. And then you can filter on the long-term illness days, anything greater than or equal to one, which it should never be one because long-term illness days are 15 consecutive absences or more. So, but obviously we're just saying we want anything greater than one, greater than or equal to one. And then you can go in and click on the mass change button on the employee record. And <clears throat> since you're filtering, you've already got your, all your employees that have a long-term illness day listed. You could go into mass change and under the low definition, click on the clear uh, employee long-term illness option, the, the definition. And when you click the execution mode and click submit mass change, it's going to blank out every one of those long-term illness days that are sitting out there. So then they will be all set to start entering long-term illness day for 21, fiscal year 2021. And here's just a screenshot of the employee record. Hey, Lori. Yes, yes. Yes. There's a quick question in the chat about the STRS advance. If the number of days worked in June 30th is incorrect, can they change the job calendar? This was for STRS advance. Um, so they want to change the job calendar. I mean, if it was me, I would probably just, I think you have the capability of changing. Let's just go into the compensation record. I believe you have the, the capability of adding an adjustment for days work. So you could just change that instead of the, the calendar. But let me double check here. Pretty sure. Let's go in here. Let's take a look. Sorry. Everything is a little tired this morning. Here we go. Let me just pull somebody up. Um, you should be able to go in, if I remember correctly, which don't count my don't count me on that because sometimes I don't remember correctly. Um, you could create a compensation adjustment. Days work. Yeah. So you could actually go in here and just add. So maybe they're short, you know, 10 days. You could just add 10 here and then it would update this. See if I added 10 days here, it would update this to where is it? Contact me for it'd be 114 when I make the adjustment. 
there. Yeah. So that's probably what you're going to want to do instead of changing the calendar. Does that help? Does that make sense? What if it's for, Lori, this is for the whole, all the teachers in the district. Uh-huh. For everyone. Can you do a mass change on it? Yeah, you might be able to. Let's take a look and see. Oh, I don't know if you can. I don't know if you can do a mass change of day's work, but you may be able to do a mass load. Let's take a look at the mass load and see if day's work is an option. Maybe. Everything is real slow here. Go in. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Okay. Facilities. Lori, I believe you can do a mass load because I thought you yeah. helped me with one before. I think I'm but thinking you can. had to have all fields. Yeah, I think you I can. think you had to have all the fields though. Yeah, you're yeah, because you don't want to change something. Yeah, I think you're right. So let's look at the compensation record. Um Yep, contract days work. So yes, but the thing is, you're still going to have to have like, like Tammy was saying, there are certain fields that you have to have on the record in order to be able to change that, that day's work. So right here to update a compensation record, you have to have the code, position number, position employee number, the type. I'm not quite sure about that. And then you obviously would do your uh, contract day's work. So you could mass change the day's work if you had to. You have to do a mass load. Or I shouldn't say mass change, mass, lo mass load. Um, like I said, I don't believe there's a mass change option for that. Let me look here, let me make sure. Uh, yeah, contract day's work isn't even listed on here. Yeah, so you'd have to use the mass load option right now, the way it looks, or do it manually, one or the other. Does that help? Is that Brenda? I think it was Brenda. Is that? I was just hoping that we could change the calendar like we did in Classic. Um, let me double one, check. Let me double check with Mark on that. Let me double check with Mark on that and and find out for sure if that would if that would hurt anything because. To be honest, I don't think if you change the calendar, I don't think it's going to make any change to that. So, but let me double check that to make sure. Let me write this down. I was changing the um, a date in the future. So, like if they're working through June seventh, and I needed to take one day out. Okay. I would take that day off. Gotcha. Yeah. Let me double check with Mark. And on it that. seemed, I don't know in the background. Okay. Yeah. We'll double check that because I'm not sure how they've got it. So that job calendar is working with the compensation. You know, in classic, you could just change it and it would automatically be fine. But I don't know if it does that in redesign. So I will double check with him on that. And then I'll let everyone know. I'll send a message out when I send the CEO or whatever. I'll let you guys know what, what he says about that. How's that sound? Does that sound okay? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, again, we talked about this a few minutes ago, but um, at this point, once you've cleared out all the long-term illness days from 1920, the district can go in and start adding long-term illness days for the current 2021 fiscal year. And again, uh, long-term illness day is 15 or more consecutive absences. And one thing to keep in mind, if you're entering long-term illness days, you have to make sure that the attendance record reflects those consecutive absence days as well because the two work together, the absences and the long-term illness, you gotta make sure that they're in both places, just like you did in classic, nothing is different there. 
Um, another thing for EMIS reporting, um, obviously reporting out for, for final window is not closed yet. From what I'm understanding, it's August 6th is the scheduled date right now. Hopefully ODE does not change that, but as of right now, it's August 6th. So at this point, um, districts should go out and create their contractor CJ records and their CC records. In reality, they probably should already have those out there unless they have you know, some new employees or something that they didn't add them for previously. They need to make sure that all that is out there. And then under the EMIS entry area in the redesigned, so on the screen here, under core EMIS entry, <coughs> The district will have the capability to go in when they're in the contractor contracted service record. They have an extract CC data option, which will create an extract file for them. And they can actually take that file. And if they're in charge of loading it to the SIP data collector, they can do that. Or if they have to send it securely to their EMIS coordinator, they can do that as well. Um, one thing to keep in mind about the EMIS contract or the CJ records, if under system uh, modules, if the contractor module is not turned on, which is this module right here, it was turned on. I'm going to go ahead and turn it off. But you have to have that turned on in order, in order to be able to see that tab under the EMIS, EMIS entry area. So I'm going to go back to the EMIS entry area. Now you're going to see that that CJ, that contractor service CJ record tab is no longer there. So if they have CJ records, they have to make sure that they're in, they go under modules and they turn that module on. Once they do that, and then they're in the EMIS entry area, they'll see the CJ option, the tab option. And again, the, this option has the same thing as CC where you could create an extract file for uploading into the data collector when they've got all the data created. And then here's just some screenshots of those, of the uh, AMIS entry record. A month end closing, nothing is different here as far as like their month end closing. They're going to run their SERS per pay report. You know, they're gonna verify all of their totals, make sure the days are correct for the employees for the month, just like they normally do. And then the earnings times 10% equal the contributions. And then they're gonna create their SCRS tape file and then save it to their desktop or a folder. And then they're gonna upload it to the Easter's website. Same thing for SCRS reporting, they're gonna generate that report. Again, verifying the days, making sure the contributions equal the total deductions and the warrant checks that were created for SCRS. And then the earnings times of 14% should equal their contributions. <clears throat> and then they're going to create, a, does somebody have a question? Okay, sorry. Um, the create their uh, SCRS submission file, just like they normally do at month end, and then submit it to SCRS. And remember, there's two options for submitting. They could either create the file, save it to their folder, and then go out to the SCRS website and upload it. Or we have that, uh, that option where you can click generate submission file and submit to SCRS button, which will do everything all at one time. But create the file and it will submit it to SCRS. So the districts have those options. Um, they have the capability of running the SCRS month report. That's optional, but um, a lot of districts do it just for the fake fact that they use it for balancing each month. So they can go in and run that report. Again, that's up the, you know, at the end of every month, they probably do. And then another monthly process is going in and uh, using the check register. So if they have to reconcile any checks or, or if they want to do an auto, you, an auto reconcile, they can do that as well. So either manually or use the auto reconcile option, whichever they use, doesn't matter. And then when they've done that, they'll go in and um, go to the report manager and run the SSDT outstanding checks report or the payment transaction status report. 
and that will give them a listing of all outstanding payments, um, selecting basically they can select the pay for the payment transaction status option, and that will give them all outstanding checks that are sitting out there. They're going to want to balance their payroll account. Again, this is all the month end processes that they normally do. And then same thing, they normally probably at the end of the month or a certain time of the month, they process the benefit update and projection where they actually uh, do their accruals for sick and vacation. They'll do that as well at the end of the month. Then we have your quarter end closing. Again, same thing as any other quarter. They're gonna to go to the, the reports, they go to the quarter report. And that report, the quarter report is gonna list all the quarter to date figures. And that all comes from history and any adjustments that were made for the quarter. Those are all going to be pulled into that quarter report. And then they're gonna to wanna to compare that quarter report total to the any outstanding payable checks written uh, for the quarter uh, for each payroll item code. So they're gonna to wanna to make, uh, you know, comparison, making sure that their totals on the quarter report match the checks that they process for their payroll deductions. Um, and then you want to keep tell them to keep in mind they want to be cautious of any payroll items that they combine with, uh, that are combined by payee. And then if they find any differences, they need to resolve those differences. They need to figure out why there's a difference. Could have been a void or something like that, that they need to determine why there's a difference. So they're going to take that total gross off of the quarter report and compare that to all the total of the payroll clearance checks that were written out of USAS. And then um, they, will, they will make sure if they had any voided checks during the quarter, they subtract the gross from those checks uh, from the payroll clearance checks that were written. So they want to make sure if there was anything voided that they subtract out because that could affect their balancing if they don't do that. And then here's a screenshot of your quarter report. And this is just where the total gross uh, uh, information is located on that report. They're gonna also wanna balance the calculated adjusted gross on the quarter report. So that calculated adjusted gross is going to be your total gross amount minus uh, the total annuities plus any non-cash earnings. So like your life insurance payments, if there was, you know, NC like uh, non cash or uh, maybe paid for uh, t shirts or something like that, those are non cash earnings. Those are going to be included. You have to add those to that, that total gross minus annuities. You got to add those, that total to it. Um, that should equal your calculated adjusted gross. Now, if for some reason that total is off, the district can verify the total annuities equal total of outstanding payable payments made to annuity companies. So in reality, they've kind of already maybe done that when they're verifying their payroll um, to payroll item totals compared to the check totals. Um, they could also run an audit report and look for any manual changes that were made to the payroll items. Um, maybe an amount, annuity amounts withheld, federal, um, applicable gross, those kind of adjustments that were made, those could make, those could affect the balancing on that, on, on that aspect. And then also verify any non-cash amounts that may have been paid. Those are some things that they can look at if they're balanced, if they're not in balance. Again, here's a screenshot of the quarter report and I forgot to highlight the total annuities and then the calculated adjusted gross, I forgot to. I forgot to highlight that, but there's a screenshot of it. <laughs> okay. Um, all payroll item checks for the quarter should equal the total payroll items showing on the quarter report. And we kind of talked about this earlier. But we got to make sure that those all match. Um, and you want to have to tell your district to make sure that they verify any electro electronic transfers, probably from your federal, Medicare, maybe state, things like that. Um, and that's going to be true for every single payroll item that's listed on the report. They can also process W-2 a report. And I, as we suggest, a lot of districts do this every month, you know, just to make sure that's right. They want to do every quarter, that's up to them. But it, it kind of helps solve problems at the end of the year instead of, you know, waiting until the end of the year to run it. They run it each quarter or every month just to make sure everything looks good. 
Um, but they're going to run that W-2 report and submission, and then they can balance that W-2 report um, with, you know, a quarter report even as far as like the payroll items. Um, some districts, again, prefer to run every quarter, every month. It's up to them. Um, that is going to be the, a list of payroll item for total for taxes and total of annuities. And then you could also use the W-2 report to complete and balance the W-2 reconciliation sheet. And that reconciliation sheet is, I don't remember if I put that out here or not. Let me double check. I don't think I did. I know it's under our calendar year end uh, documentation. I might put it out here as well. That way it, it's, you could find it because district could be using that throughout the whole entire year to keep that uh, in balance. I'll go ahead and put that out in the fiscal our supporting documents when we get finished today. Um, another thing that the district will want to make sure that they check is make sure there are no outstanding payables sitting out there that have not been paid. Um, they could actually just go into the outstanding payable screen. They shouldn't see anything. Um, but they could also go up to the report and run it and make sure nothing shows up on that report. And as, as it says here, generally there are no outstanding deductions at quarter end. If there, for some reason there is, the district's going to want to make sure that they get those paid for the quarter, get that, get that done. Uh, another thing for the quarter, if the district is wanting to submit their own ODGFS file, they can do that but they need to go into the system configuration, ODJFS configuration record. And you can see the screenshot here. You have to have the district will submit own files ODJFS checked. And then you also have to have the information for the transmitter title, which is like the district name and then the district's phone number and save that. And then that way that will give them the capability of creating their own ODJFS submission file and submitting it on their own instead of having to send it to the ITC and have them submit, it, submit that for them. And again, that is strictly up to the ITC how they want to handle that. So again, for the quarter, they go to the OD reports, ODJFS report, and they're going to click on the generate report button. And then they're going to uh, process the report and they'll check all the totals for the quarter and check, check the weeks. And then remind your district, keep in mind that the, the taxable wages that are listed on the report are used uh, for contributing employers. Uh, the calculated value is based on the ODGFS rules. So, so the ODGFS taxable wage base is currently $9,000 for 2021. So if that has been met, if they made $9,000 or more, that it's going to show zero in that ODGFS taxable wage field in the year-to-date column, year-to-date taxable wage column. So just tell the district to keep that in mind if they see zero dollars in that year-to-date taxable wage column, not to panic because they've already met the, the wage base, the threshold. So when the district determines all the data on the report is correct, they can click uh, generate the submission file button, and then they're going to save the ODJFS file to their desktop or a folder that they choose to save it to. And again, either they can securely email that file to the ITC for submission, or if they have the capability of submitting it on their own, they have can just go in, let me go here. Oh, sorry. Never mind. I was thinking something. I was thinking a different screen. Um, they'll, so they'll have the, the file in their desktop or their full, and then they go to the ODGFS ERIC website and they'll upload that file. And here's just screenshots of the ODGFS report screen. Okay, so after all the June pays are completed, if the district is aware of any pay, early, con, early contract payoffs that are going to happen maybe through the summer months, they could go in and change the number of pays in the contract on the compensation record for that employee. Uh, because because you know, maybe they're gonna pay them off you know, 
in two pays. Then they have four pays left. They could reduce, you know, the, the number of pays. They could change that down by two. Um, but just tell the district to be cautious because the paper period will get changed when they change the number of pays in the contract, just so they're aware of that. And also, if the district is aware of any docs that are going to be processed through the summer months, maybe during the advance, um, they actually could go in and enter that full doc amount in future. And when they do that, that when you when they run the SRS advance, it's going to take that amount into, into consideration and, and uh, that employee will appear correctly on the advance as far as those doc amounts. So what they could do, like I said, put them in future, and then after the advance has been set, after they you know run SCRs advance to create the file, uh, they could go into future and then just get rid of those docs. And then what they could do is on each pay, they could just enter the doc in, or they could use the effective date if they wanted to. They could just enter those docs in each pay, and then at the end of the advance, it should they should be correct. They should match what was sent to SCRS as far as their advance amount. Um, again, now we're in the point where the district could actually go in and rerun the advance reports, all of those those three reports again, verify everything, make sure it looks accurate. Um, again, the advanced fiscal year to date report is going to give them all employees and jobs that were subject to SCRS withholding. All employees with any amounts that were uh, paid during the fiscal year are going to be on that report. And then that, so the service credit that is listed on the report is based on the SCRS decision tree. And we have the SCRS decision tree and that part-time decision tree listed under the supporting documentation. The advanced fiscal year date report um, is a complete listing of all the employees as we talked about. And then the parameters for jobs to advance. So basically anybody that should be on the advanced report, there are certain parameters that have to be met. The work days have to equal the day's work. The amount uh, remaining to pay is greater than zero and the pays are greater than the pays paid. Those are the three things. And then, like I said, it's very similar to classic. All three of those criteria must be met. And if they are, those employees are gonna have an accrued contribution amount that is gonna be calculated for them within the system. And that amount is gonna be the amount of the earnings not yet paid times the employee's SCRS withholding rate. And uh, the accrued contributions are gonna be calculated using the paper period from the compensation record for the remaining pay minus one. Uh, then the last pay calculation occurs. And so here is a screenshot of like how the system is calculating the advance payments, what it does as far as like, you know, the last four pays that are going to be paid to the employee. The advanced physicians report, again, are all the employees that have accrued contributions that were calculated by the system that are going to be considered advanced over the summer months. Um, but keep in mind, if you have employees that have the increased compensation flag set on the 450 record, um, the figures may be inflated on the, this report because of those, because of that flag being set. Um, they're gonna wanna make sure that they look at this report very carefully. And what we say be consistent with prior years basically means if this employee was on advance last year, they should be on advance again this year. So, you know, maybe you had someone that was uh, a teacher last year, but they were a principal this year. Well, maybe that's an exception because this year, maybe that the principals do not advance because of the way that their pay structure is set up. So they are not on the advance, but last year he did. That's a different story, but I mean, it, if they advance from year to year, he should advance this year. Every year, they should be advanced on the advance schedule, not you know advance last year, not advance this year, advance last year. It should be consistent. And another thing we want to make sure is they check the supplemental contracts because a lot of times those get missed. If they're supposed to advance over the summer month, they want to make sure that those supplemental contracts are included in the advance. 
the not advanced positions are going to give you employees with jobs that are not advancing. So if the job has no amount remaining to pay, but it meets all the other criteria, like we talked about earlier, the other, other, three, other two criteria, they're going to be on the non-advancement report. If the day's work plus remaining days from the calendar through June exceed the total work days, they're going to be on this non-advanced position report. And more than likely, as I talked about earlier, your principals, things like that, because they have work days um, on the calendar through June 30th that are exceeding the total work days. And just tell your districts, to keep in mind, this isn't a catch-all of, of, you know, possibly in jobs that aren't in, or should be advancing or not advancing. Got to make sure they really have to be uh, pretty critical on this and verify these employees on the non advance on the advance, making sure that they're in the right in the right area. Uh, they they can check any warnings or errors on the SRS SCR, advance report. Um, again, under our documentation, we have a listing of all the uh, errors and warnings, what they mean and possibly how to fix them. Um, that is out under the supporting documentation. The district is going to want to verify the service credit that is listed on the uh, report for each employee. And again, if an employee has 120 days or more, they're going to receive 100% credit. Anybody that has less than 120 days receives credit based on the SRS decision tree. Um, employees that are classified as part-time, so they're listed as part-time on the employee record, their service is based on that SRS part-time decision tree because there's a different way of calculating that information. And again, that uh, is out in our supporting documentation as well. Keep in mind, any re-employed retirees are always going to have a 0% credit reported with their contributions. And then there's a calculated service credit for rehired retirees. And that may flag a warning. That's nothing to be real concerned about. If there's an error, that's a concern. But if it's a warning, it's not a critical error. Uh, staff that rehire, retired and rehired in the same fiscal year, they're going to appear twice on the report. One line is going to be for contributions prior to retirement, and then the other line will be after retirement contributions. Uh, you want to make sure if you have a rehired retiree that that rehired retiree box on the 450 record has been checked. And then here's just a little detailing of how the part-time employees calculations are done. And again, that decision tree is out there. You can look at that as well. Um, here are the links for the part-time decision tree. And then also the SCRS service guide or service credit guideline. There's uh, links for both of those. If the districts want to use those, they can. The advanced fiscal year to date report uh, should be used for balancing, which you're going to balance the amount that shows in the deposit pickup column on the report. And that should total the outstanding payable checks that have already been written to SRS, plus the use has checks that were for pickup amounts. So those total together should equal that deposit pickup column amount, column amount on that report. If, the, if that is not in balance and for some reason the district cannot get it resolved, you can have them contact you at the ITC and maybe you can assist them. If you can't figure out or that you cannot get it, you know, figure out what the problem is, the district may be able to call SRS because a lot of times they can find the problem quicker than we can at that point um, because they balance, SRS balances, balances by employee as well as by districts. So a lot of times they may be able to find the problem a lot quicker. Uh, once the, the district determines that the SCRS advance information is correct, they can go to the reports SCRS advance and this time click on the submission file button. When they do that, that's going to set the advance flag on the compensation record. It's going to check it. And then it also places total accrued contribution amounts in the SCRS uh, advanced configuration record in, the, in that uh, record on the um, SRS uh, configuration record under system configuration. It sets that amount in there as well as it sets the advanced mode box. 
So at that point, that box will be checked and the total dollar amount of the advance is going to be included in the advance amount for configuration. And then it's also going to create their annual reporting submission file. So there's kind of three things that, that happens when the advance submission file is created. The district can print a final copy of the report if they of the reports that they want to. Um, they don't have to because all of the, the advanced reports will get sent out to the file archive under the fiscal year end reports. So all of those should be sitting out there. If the district has third party da data that needs to be included in their submission file, maybe like they have uh, employees from Runhill that have to be included or that there's another uh, Dixie something or another. If they have third party data that needs to be included, the district's going to need to get that data from the third party vendor in the correct format. And I have the correct SRSD format out on the supporting documentation. They're gonna have to, the third party vendor has to give the, the district a file with that data that, that the district can then have merged with their advanced tape file. Now, one really exciting thing to know is we will have an STRS merge process in place in the redesign uh, for fiscal year 21. So no more having to take the file that you get and take their advanced file and pull it over into classic and use the merge file merge process. We don't have to do that anymore. You actually can go in in the redesign and there will be a merge program out there. And that currently is scheduled to be released on the 640 release, which is just, I think it's the 21st of May. Um, if for some reason something happens critical and doesn't, it will go out on the next release, but still in time before fiscal year end processing actually starts. So we will have that in place. Uh, after the merge process has taken place, the district's going to then get the report with the merge data included. And then they're going to go uh, to the SRS uh, advanced report and click on the choose file button and find their file. And then they're actually going to submit or upload that file to STRS at that point. Because at that point, it has the merge data included. Then they're good. They can actually submit the file. Um, another thing they want to do, and this is like after fiscal year and closing, they're going to want to run a surcharge report, an SERS surcharge report, because what that does is um, there's additional charges that are levied on salaries that are lower than the SERS um, minimum, which uh, for fiscal year 21 was $23,000. So they're going to go in and run that SERS surcharge report. It's going to create a worksheet. <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, that basically they can keep. And then um, when SERS sends them the data regarding surgery, they can kind of compare and make sure that what SERS is saying that you are surcharged for is actually what you have in the system. So you're kind of comparing the two. And tell the districts to keep in mind that if they have surcharge payments due, they have to be paid within 30 days of the notification uh, from the final surcharge amount that has been calculated. So that basically needs to be uh, submitted 30 days after the notification, that final notification that they get from SERS. Um, another post uh, advance program they're gonna wanna do is they're gonna wanna go to reports and then go to the Auditor of State CSV report. And they're gonna to wanna to generate the payment history CSV and the payment distribution CSV files. These are kind of like the official audit reports that were in classic. And then they can email those files to this email address, which is the Ohio uh, Auditor of State. Another thing that they wanna do is go to reports and run the wage obligation by employee report and uh, save the report because the, uh, they can use that for the SERS liability report for the auditors. If the auditors come in, they can you know, have that report available to show them. <clears throat> um, correcting mistakes. So let's just say the district has created their tape file for the advance. 
All right. If for some reason they determine, oh my gosh, we should have, this person should have been on the advance or this one shouldn't have been on the advance. If a payroll for July has not been processed yet, you can actually unflag the employees out of the advance and take them out of advanced mode and make those corrections and then rerun the answer as advanced option. So these are kind of the steps that need to be taken if that would happen. So um, there's a mass change uh, uh, option, which out in the supporting documents, we have where you could go in and you could change that mass change flag to false or, or mass change, <laughs> change the SRS advanced flag to false. And then the, uh, you'd have to go into system configuration, the advanced configuration and uncheck the advanced mode flag. That way it takes them out of the advance and that advance amount is going to go away. At that point, when they do that, everything is taken that has taken them out of advance. They can correct their mistakes and then rerun the SRS advanced submission file, create the new file. And then when they do that, their, you know, their new amount where it's going to sit out there in the SRS advanced amount, they'll be in advanced mode, and the employee compensations will be in the advanced uh, stage as well. If a payroll has already been processed for July and they figured there was a figured out there was a problem, it's a little too late at that point. And what they're going to end up having to do is file corrections with SCRS regarding the employee or employees that were, you know, incorrect. Uh, keep in mind that during the payroll process in July, August, September, when you're in advance, the fiscal year to date amounts on the 450 the 591 and 691 payroll items are, are going to show both the advance amounts and new earnings. Uh, if you wanted to see just what amounts are, are advanced, there's a check STRS advance report out there that you could process, and that will show you just what is paid during the advance. And then every payroll, at the bottom of the pay report, it's going to show you the payroll item STRS advancement amount. So that amount will be on the pay report. And then also there's a JSON file, and we have this out on the supporting documents that can be uploaded uh, out there. You know, like I said, I have it on the share or the supporting documents, but we also have it out in the share reports or mass change definitions. Here's the link to that page. And this will pull in employee's name, pay dates, the SRS advance grows, yeah, the total SRS advance, and the total SRS non advance amount. And here's just a screenshot of what that report looks like if you use that report. Tell your district to keep in mind that during the advance, there are certain pay types that cannot be used with, on a job of the advance that is advanced. <laughs> um, that pay type would be a, a reg or an IRR, irregular pay type. Those cannot be used on an employee that is in the advance mode. <coughs> there are certain pay types that affect balancing of the uh, advanced configuration amount on the advanced configuration screen. Those would be docs that are not already accounted for. So if you had docs that you put in future and then you're docking during the normal payroll processing during the summer, those won't be affecting it. But if you for some reason had to dock someone that wasn't included in, in, as, as a doc for the advance, that will affect your balancing. The back pay will affect the, the SRS advance amount the termination and the payoff can also affect it. And those are normally make it a few cents off, a few cents difference. Um, keep in mind the number of pays can be modified. So the pays and pays paid are different by one. So maybe you're forcing a contract payoff, you wanna pay somebody off right now, you still can do that. You can go in and just change the number of uh, pays, <clears throat> make that uh, different by one and, and pay that person off. But you will notice if you do that, your advanced configuration amount will probably be off. It won't be in balance because of the, the calculation for that final payment. Um, the amount paid back on the SRS advanced configuration screen will increase every payroll. So basically, if you're in 
Let me take a look here. Actually, you could go into, oh, let's just go here. If I go to the SRS configuration screen, you can see my advance amount of amount paid back. So every payroll, this figure should be increasing. Every payroll. And then on the last payroll, what should happen if all is well in the world, this amount would match this amount up here. And then if it does, all these are going to be blanked out. They're going to be zero. So that would be really great. If the, that would mean that the advance amount paid off correctly. <coughs> also, I was going to show you too under organization here. You can see also under organization, if, you're, if your users don't have access to like the system STRS configuration, they can go to organization. They could also see that STRS advanced information here as well. The advanced amount, the advanced mode, amount paid back. They can see that here in the same fashion as on the configuration record. So after all the summer pays are complete, the district or is going to want to verify that the amount paid back is zeroed out. Again, in the real world, in the perfect world, everything those should be zeroed out. They should be out of the advance room. If the amount paid back is equal or greater than the advance amount, the district is going to come onto the advance and the advance flag will be unchecked. When the advance flag on the configuration is unchecked, the amount paid back will always display zero. If the district for some reason is wanting to see how much was paid back, they could go in and check the advance mode box. And when they do that, that amount will appear on there, the amount that, that they pay back. <coughs> But if the, for some reason they, they check that advance mode box, they want to make sure that they uncheck it after they're finished finding out what they, the advance amount paid was, because that way they're not in advance. If for some reason the amount paid back is less than the advance amount after the last pay, the advance flag on the configuration is not going to be unchecked, meaning they're not out of advance. So at that point, uh, <clears throat> the amount paid back is going to continue to show. At that point, um, they're going to have to go out and run that, that check STRS advance report. And what they will do with that report is compare it with the totals on the advanced position report to see whose totals don't match. Because that person or persons is a problem, they're going to have to contact STRS and tell them, hey, you know, we sent this to you saying John Smith was going to be paying this much during the advance. Well, he's, he did not. He only paid this much. Once those corrections are made with STRS, then the um, advance mode flag should be unchecked, and then everything should be at zero, the advance amount and the amount paid back. But you got to make sure that those corrections are made with STRS before they, they, take, they get taken out of the advance mode. <clears throat> to begin the July payroll processing, the district can go to the posting period and create the July posting period. Um, the posting period has to be at least open in order to begin payroll processing. Uh, to post the payroll process, they have to actually be in current. So July would have to be in current at that point. Um, we're going to talk about the EMIS checklist a little bit for the new fiscal year. And again, here's the link. We have that in the supporting documentation as well. So after the uh, previous fiscal year window closes, which again is set currently for August 6th, the district is going to have to go out or the ITC. I'm not sure how ITCs are doing this, but someone has to go out and they have to change the fiscal year on the uh, EMIS reported configuration record to the new fiscal year, which will be 2022. And they have to save that change. Um, if there are any new July contracts, which there normally always are, 
the EMI's overwrite fields on the physician record are going to need to be used to report the fiscal year 21 data as far as the, the amount, the work days, hours, et cetera, that those EMIS fields, those are going to need to be populated with that data to make sure that the correct information gets pulled into the data collector. And again, the final all period is scheduled to close at this point on August 6th. Um, after the advance is finished, so after the advance is complete, um, you know, they paid their last one maybe beginning of September, you know, whenever they're done. Um, the district can go out, they don't have to, this is an option. They could go out and, and change the reportable to EMIS flag on the compensation records to be false. So basically, no, it's not reportable. They could do that. They don't have to, it's optional. But, you know, they, they may want to, they may not want to. But if they do, there is a mass change definition that will help them do that. Um, it's called EMIS equals false. <clears throat> and that definition can be found out there in the redesign chair training and implementation documents under the reports, or no, under the mass change definitions, sorry. They could go in, download the file, and then they could go into uh, compensations Built with the compensations to only pull up uh, compensations from 2021. You know, maybe they, if they had a certain starting date, they could, you know, greater than 7 1 2020 or whatever. Um, or maybe they have the label or description marked as 2021 teacher, 2021 cook. They could filter that way. However, they can filter it to get those 2021 compensation records. They can do that. Once they filter those records, they can use the mass change tab, and then they can go in and they can load that definition, that EMIS equals false definition into the mass change script. Once they do that, they're gonna see that available under the load definitions. They could then go in, click on that EMIS equals false, select the execution mode, and then click the submit mass change option when they do that, it will flag, it will change the EMIS reportable flag from a check to unchecked, from true to false. <clears throat> but one thing, this is the next thing to keep in mind, and I think it's kind of important for your districts because this is something that you definitely want to do. Like I said, the other- Lori? Are, yes. Yes. Oh, you have a ticket uh, a question out there from Andrew. Why would you need to use the EMIS override fields for new contracts? You know what, Andrew, as you say that, you're correct. Because, because those dates, if, it, if as long as they have start and stop dates on the compensation record, which if they, if they created the compensation in redesign, they should. If they were legacy, it's possible they do not have start and stop dates on there. As long as they have start and stop dates within the current fiscal year, then they would be fine. They wouldn't have to use the EMIS override fields. If for some reason those are legacy records and they don't have compensation start and stop dates up for the current fiscal year, then you would have to because if you don't, um, it won't pull the, it, it probably will not pull in the correct record, is my guess. Um, although it may, if they have a compensation start date, it may. I'm going to double check, Andrew, with uh, Andy on that to make sure, because I know normally the data collector is looking for dates within the fiscal year. So if the start date was within the fiscal year, we may be okay. I'll double check on that, and I will also send that when I send the, the, the CEUs. So you don't necessarily have to use those EMIS override fields if those dates are correct. But I will double check with Andy and I will let you guys know that for sure. But that is an option that you can use if you had to. Okay, um, after the advance is completed, again, this is something you're gonna wanna do is 
um, go to the comp contract compensation or non-contract compensation and filter using the compensation stop date or description. Again, you want to filter to pull in all the 2021 compensation records. And then using mass change, uh, you can select the archive employee definition. Again, that definition is out there under uh, mass change definitions in the report share uh, report or mass change definition area. You could download that uh, definition and then import it into compensations mass change. Once you filter the data in compensations, click mass change. You can load that uh, archived employee uh, script definition. You can load that in. And what that definition is going to do, it's going to archive the old contracts. And what that does is it, it it's, it's twofold. It prevents them from pulling into the MIS collection because, like I said, if they have a date within the fiscal year, well, your 2021 are probably going to have a stop date within the fiscal year because you're paying them clear through maybe August, September on the advance. If you don't, if you do not archive those records, they're going to pull into the data collector for th that one as well as the new compensation will pull in. We want to make sure that we archive those records. And then another thing that it does as well, it prevents those jobs from pulling into, like if you're uh, going into future or current adding a record under compensation, if you do not have the old compensation archived, it will pull in. So you might see two job ones, you, you know, and it doesn't really define which one is for this year, which one is for, you know, previous year. So it's a good thing to get those archived for both purposes, EMIS and for payroll. And then one thing to keep in mind, if an employee was not reported as separated at the end of the previous fiscal year, maybe they left over the summer months, the district didn't know the person was leaving, they're going to have to report that employee the new fiscal year as separated for the entire fiscal year. They can't archive the record. They gotta keep them on archive for the whole fiscal year, the new fiscal year, until the end of that fiscal year is done. Um, district can be out creating job calendars right now if they have the job calendar set for next year, which they probably do. Uh, they're gonna use the job calendars option. What they could do is create one calendar for 21-22. And then there's that copy feature that we have out there in job calendars that they can just copy that one calendar that they made over to all different calendars. And then they can just go in and tweak specific calendars. Maybe the custodians work more days than the teachers, et cetera, bus drivers, whatever. But you can tweak those calendars to, uh, to comply with what the schedule should be for that particular uh, calendar. Keep in mind that Yes. There's another question for you from Lori Nye. I don't believe we will the district has not completed their final staff submission and has contracts starting July 1st. Will they need to turn off their EMIS reportable for the 21 22? Hold on. There's two questions here. The district has completed their final submission. Yes, that would be correct. That would be. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me think. If the district can complete their final. Yes, that would be absolutely correct. So if they if they have not completed their fiscal year 2021 submission and they've got new July contracts out there, those new July contract. No, 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 no. I take that back. I'm sorry. No, because the new July contracts have a July 1st, July 1 of 2021. That's the new fiscal year. So those contracts should not have to be archived because EMIS looked at the fiscal year that the district is in. So if they have July contracts sitting out there, those are for 22, 2022 fiscal year. Those should not be getting pulled into the data collector if they have a July 1st, 2021 contract start date. So no, they should not have to un unflag the EMIS reportable flag according to 
uh, the developers, what we've been told. No, you should not have to do that. Does that make sense, everybody? Mm. Lori, just to clarify something there, if sure. people are in um, getting paid for their, like, let's say their first pay is July 5th, okay, mm -hmm. and the pay period is the end of June, that would be a different scenario than what you just stated, correct? They would sure. have to uncheck that. No, 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 because you're talking about payroll, right? Are you talking about right, payroll? It would be a reportable compensation. It would be a reportable compensation for EMIS. Yes. But would that be reported in 21 or 22? If they're getting paid from- Like if from, they had a- I'm sorry. So if they are first pay for the 21-22 calendar or fiscal year mm -hmm. was July 5th, but that pay period was at the end of June, just because they haven't, they need to do a seven-year skip or something. Mm -hmm. um, would they need to uncheck that kind of a scenario so it doesn't get reported in this fiscal year 21? No. Because the pay the payroll portion of it isn't going to EMIS. The only thing that going is going to EMIS is, is data from the compensation record, as far as like like their total obligation things like that. Not how much they've, they've been paid, so that shouldn't have any bearing on it whatsoever. So like if they were being paid at the end of June for their new contract in July, it shouldn't make any difference. It shouldn't have any bearing on the EMIS reporting portion of it because that data is all it's not coming out of what what they've been paid that's coming from what their comp, what their actual obligation is for the contract and that contract would be basically reported in 2022. Does that make sense Roxana? I think so. I was just thinking like, cause the compensation start date would have to be in June in order for them to get paid in July. So I was just trying to think that out, but thank you. Gotcha. I, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Lori, um, can I ask, this is Lori. Yeah. yeah. Hello? Lori, this is Lori again. Can I ask another question? I, I'm trying, sure. can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay. I think the trouble we ran into last year, um, and I'm trying to remember correctly, um, is that the compensation start date, you know, is from like say August. The stop date needs to be one day less than, you know, next year's start date. So that for teachers and those nine months paid over 12 falls into August, like the following August, or it could. So right. those records from fiscal year 21 are being reported. They're not done with their 21 reporting yet. So now they've created their new contracts because they be, need to, you know, begin paying on them. So we ran into a problem where fiscal year 21 wasn't done yet. But now they've they have 22 with August dates, so they were both being pulled in. Okay, okay, so, I see what you said, but that's why I mean, that's why had, it's, that's why it's had, important, but, Lori. That's why it's important after. Okay, because like I said, right now August 6th is the final out reporting period right now that's what they've got scheduled okay so after your final l reporting period those 2021 compensations need to be archived because once you archive them they will not pull into the new data collection for 2021 22 because when were they, the thing is, when were they pulling in? Uh, Lori, I think part of the problem. 
I think part of the problem too, Lori, is, and especially those that uh, their contracts change in July, um, if you don't, if you don't uncheck the report to EMIS on the FY22 uh, compensation records for your um, people who whose new contracts start in July and uh, possibly even the first pay of August, then those will get picked up instead of, well, in addition to the FY21 compensation records, but with uh, the data collector pulling on the stop dates, and I was reading what Andrea uh, put in there, um, at one point you said that when you did the new contracts, you would have to put the FY21 information in the EMIS only fields on the position record so that they're remaining uh, for the um, FY21 contract would get reported until that, until the end of the um, uh, FY21 staff collection. Uh, I'm, I'm a little confused on that. I'm thinking that if you just, um, when the, if you not check report to EMIS on the FY22 contracts until, F, until FY21 is closed and then use mass change to change the FY21 compensation records to not report and okay. check the FY22 to be reported, then I think that would correct the issues that we were having last year. Okay, well, I, I will definitely talk to Andy about this because I mean, in reality, it should not be working like that. I understand what you're saying because you're saying that if they have new July contracts, it is pulling in the old 2021 contract as well as the new one information. It shouldn't be doing that because of the contract, uh, the compensation of certain stop dates. But for now, as Mary said, you could definitely go in and uncheck that EMIS flag on the new contracts for the July new contracts. And then like we do have a mass change program that you can actually go in and, and then just mass change them back to true after the EMIS reporting is finished. But really that is not really how it should be working. So I'm gonna definitely speak to Andy because like I said, it should, it's using those compensation start and stop dates. It should be using it from each compensation record. It shouldn't matter like if you have one from last year and then you have your new one in, it shouldn't even be looking at the new one yet because that is not the physical year that you're doing the EMIS collection for. So I'm gonna talk to Andy about that to verify. But for now, as you're saying, you could go ahead as, as Lori was saying, and, and Mary said, you could go in on your new contracts for July, uncheck the reportable to EMIS, EMIS box, merge it or purge in the contracts. And then after the final window L for 2021 is finished, you could use mass change and, and change uh, those EMIS flights back to true. That would definitely be what you're gonna have to do. But I will again, speak to Andy about that because that is really not how it should be working. You shouldn't be getting, you shouldn't be getting the, the 2021 contract and information from the 2122 contract, the new one, because that new one's dates are nothing to do with the old contract, the old fiscal year. Well, I'll definitely get some clarification on that, but for now, uh, definitely go ahead and just don't set the MIS reportable flag on the new contracts for July. Just you know, set it to false and then mass change it to true after the data collection is done. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, yes, I think it does. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, we were talking about job calendar copying. And so here's just a screenshot of how you could copy uh, like an initial job calendar over and then selecting which job calendars you want to uh, copy it to. 
new contracts, which we talked about just a few minutes ago, but uh, new contracts can be entered for all employees. Um, you can use uh, the, pro the new contract pro uh, process under processing. We have the new contract maintenance option, which is similar to the main program and classic, which is just for one employee. We have a mass copy compensation, which is similar to the build program in, in classic. And that will, you could build new contracts by pay group. You still have to go in and update each contract, you know, with the correct obligation, et cetera. But like all the other data, as far as pays, paid, and, and work days, et cetera, those all pull in. Or you could import new contracts uh, using the import option. You have to have a, a CSV file with the correct data in order to import the new contracts. If you wanted to uh, create non-contract records, um, there's a, a report called SSDT non-contract compensation mass load extract that can be used. And if you use that, it'll create a file with the header information with, for non-contracts. Um, and then all the district would have to do is update that CSV file, you know, pulling in the people they want to create uh, new contracts for, updating the information as far as maybe their, you know, their daily rate has changed or whatever. You can then go into the utilities program and use the mass load feature and under importable entities, you uh, load that right into the compensation entity. <laughs> um, keep in mind, if you're using the mass load option for the non-contract compensation, the code has to be on the CSV file. And I think we're, we're updating that on that report so the code gets included. And then the code can always be changed later on the screen uh, if, the, if the district so chooses, they can change it. Um, <clears throat> the code has to be a unique code, um, you know, example like 2122 Cook or whatever, especially if they have more than one compensation for that record. Um, if the employee already has a non contract compensation for the same position, you could archive the old contract compensation so it won't get used again and then just create a new compens contract compensation. Or the district could just manually go in and update the, the non-contract compensation that's already out there. Uh, keep in mind that mass load can be uh, used to create contract compensations for new employees. So if you have, a, have new employees, you could create a spreadsheet to upload uh, for contract compensations. And then the the fields that have to be on the CSV are defined here, the code, position number, position employee number, the type, the pay unit, and the pay plan. Those are all required on the CSV file. But then once that CSV file is created, again, you could go to uh, mass load and use the compensations options to create those new contract compensations. Okay. That is all I have. Does anybody have any other questions? Um, I will get back with you definitely about those uh, things that we spoke about. And I'm gonna talk to Andy again about that, uh, the EMIS and the new contracts in July information. Um, and I will also, I'll put that in the, the message where I send the CEUs as well, because I wanna get that clarified. But we kind of have a workaround for now as far as like, you can definitely use the MIS flag equals uh, fault and then mass change it to true after the fact. Anybody have any other questions on this? I really appreciate everybody's input. And um, we're going to go ahead and take about a five minute break so we can get set up for the USAS portion. Well, somebody asked a question here. If I knew how to tell they have a contract payoff, to change the number of pays then after running the answer advanced as well, they would change the number of pays back. So it was a timing issue on when they made the change. I'm guessing that was still true in redesign. Correct. Yes, that is correct. Whoever who put this in here, I'm not sure. Somebody from Meta. Yes, that would be it would be the same like it was in classic. You would you would you could change it so you knew how much you know what it was for the advance. And then you can actually go back in and change it again once the advance is in place. Okay. Yep. 
I think we've got all the questions answered. Uh, hold on. Hey, Lori. Yes. I like Michelle Buss's uh, this is comment. Andrew. I put this yeah. in the chat uh, too. Okay. Oh, here um, it is. I just wanted to tell people that they could, um, there is, they, um, they, you actually, for me, we had this issue. We had this issue last year with, with the double reporting that people have been talking about. So you worked with me on a ticket and you created a, a EMIS mass change for new contract. So we could turn um, them all off before they came in. So I wanted other people to know that was there if they're having that issue. So you, uh, you, yeah, I, Either you had made it before, or you gave it to me. But you helped. That helped us with our issues last year when you when you gave that to me. So I wanted to tell people about it. Yeah, and actually, I think Andrew, it is it is out in that redesign, shared, and training. I think both of those options, as far as making it true and false, let me take a look here. But I'm pretty sure that it is out there. I think I might have stuck it out there. Sorry, this is so slow. Come on. Actually, what I could do, I could put those definitions out in our uh, supporting documentation too. That might make it easier. Hold on, here, here we go. Now, EMI is equals false. You know what? I do have an EMI is equals true. I'll definitely, I'll put both of those out in the supporting documentation. That way those are out there as well. If districts need to use them, like we, like Andrew said, that would be great. Um, I like Michelle Buss's Can you idea. Put the new contract ones, too. Sorry, Lori. I just sure. because I the yep. normal true false don't work yep. in new contract. They have to have yep. those separate. So thank you. Yep, I can definitely do. Actually, those are right here, Andrew. Here's the new contract. EMI's reportable equals false. So that's probably the one that we're talking about. Yes. Yeah, yeah. that's the yep. one. I'll put that out there as well. Definitely. Um, Michelle Buss had a, com a comment. It was a really good suggestion. Uh, she said, I think it would be easier to have a drop down box on the compensation record that you can choose which fiscal year the compensation record is for. Then EMIS would be able to look at the box and know which period to report. I love that suggestion, Michelle. I think I'm going to add that. Uh, to maybe our sprint meeting or something because that's a very very good suggestion. It would it would make our life a lot easier as well as the district's lives a lot easier. So I will definitely say that. <laughs> okay. Um, are there any other questions? Let me scroll through the chat here. Hey, Lori. Yes. Yes. Lori, just I'm sorry, I, and I'm not trying to like beat a dead horse here, but. I don't think it was, it's just like the seven one contracts. I think what was happening was, and I don't know if I made it very clear, um, because the stop date falls of the 21 contracts falls in fiscal year 22's date range, those contracts were being reported as well. So it wasn't just a problem with the seven one contracts. And I remember, you know, kind of having a conversation with okay. SSDTN because the stop date is in the next fiscal year, those records are automatically being reported. So, you know, and then they have to, you know, have their new contracts in place for fiscal year 22. So, yes, I understand that we have to mass change them somehow to turn them on and off. But just using the fiscal year, like July 1, is not going to work all the time because of those stop dates needing to be past, you know, the duration that they're paying them. So that's going to fall into the next fiscal year. Right. But I guess, I guess what I, I'm trying to I figure out, Lori, is I'm trying sense. to figure out why... <laughs> I could understand if you're saying that the 2021 contracts were pulling into the 2021-22 data collection because of the stop date. I can understand that, but I can't understand why the new contracts 
for 21-22 would be pulling into the 2021 collection. They should not be. And but you're saying that the stop date, I understand the stop date on the 2021 record. Are you talking strictly July? Pardon? I'm sorry. And they may so not are you now talking with just some the of July the first? They may not now with some of the changes they did on um, date controls with the data collector. So if there is a start after July 1, it may not pull it now mm -hmm. um, in the um, 21 or the FY 21, but prior to them making the changes uh, recently, then it was pulling in. Um, I, I know they have made changes with the uh, start and stop dates on the um, what polls with the SIF collection because we have a district that just um, migrated and they had old jobs that they still had reported to EMAS. Uh, but had separation dates on them or contract end dates on them. And um, all of a sudden, those old jobs weren't being Hold reported in. in redesign, but they were still marked as yes to report in classics. So they were still being pulled in classics. So then they had a huge disparity of records that uh, had previously been reported, but aren't being reported now. So we had to go through one by one and verify which should still be reported and not. So I understand what you're saying because they did make some changes, but I don't know if with the changes that they made, if they are looking at a start date after July 1 to only pull in the FY22 uh, collection and not pull on the FY21. Um, if, if it's not working that way, then yes, we are still going to have to manipulate both the FY21 compensation records and the FY22 for that six week overlap between July 1 and August 6 to make sure that only the correct records are being reported to EMAS. Right, yeah, exactly, exactly. And so um, let's, just, let's just go with what we got for now as far as like anything you have out there for, any new contracts for fiscal year 2021-22? If you pull a new contract, make sure that your uh, EMIS reportable flag is set to false, and then do a mass change after fiscal year 2021 is reported. And I, like I said, I will speak to uh, Andy and find out exactly what's happening because maybe it's because, like Mary was saying, maybe it's because. They're looking at the dates now, but even though that the dates, maybe that EMIS reportable flag is still being looked at too. It needs to maybe do a little bit further digging. So I will definitely do some checking into that. But for now, let's just go with the the unflagging any new contracts for the new fiscal year, unflagging the EMIS reportable flag to faults until the EMIS reporting is finished for fiscal year twenty. 2021. Okay, does that sound good? Lori, does that help a little bit with what you're saying? I think I understand, I understand what you're saying as far as like, it could be, you know, <coughs> the other, other contracts other than July 1. So I understand what you're saying there. I just, I, I just know that we, it's, it's a lot of tedious, time-consuming. Yeah, it is. Work. <laughs> I it mean, is. to work in the, with every single district to yeah. get those turned off and on. Yeah. And I, I, I was hopeful that last year, when the changes, when the enhancements went out, that we wouldn't have to do as much manipulating, you know, helping the district manipulate Correct. that data as and we still it, it we still did and the okay. stop i mean you know every all your 12 month people are going to have or i'm sorry nine month people that are stretched over 12 are going to have dates i'm assuming past july 1st the stop date because they need to be paid over the summer months and once that stop date was after july 1st those all those records continue to get reported and then we had to now, turn those off. Lori, did they have you know, them archived? They did they have them archived? Reporting. 
did they have those archives, Lori? Like, yeah, I'm assuming that you're talking about they were they were doing the reporting for the new fiscal year, right? Yeah, I think Hello? Oh, Lori, you're cutting in and out. I can't hear you. <coughs> I, I can't hear what, I didn't hear what you said, Lori. You were cutting out. Let's, uh, let's just, what I'll do is I'm going to discuss this further with Andy. I'm going to send a message in my, uh, with the CEUs and tell you exactly how it's supposed to be working and explain what we really should be doing uh, for these, for the EMIS reporting. I'll let everybody know what I find out because Lori, I apologize that you were just cutting in and I really couldn't hear what you were saying, but I will definitely uh, follow up on all of this. So um, anybody else have any other questions? Okay. We're going to take about a five minute break in between here. We'll start back at about uh, 1051, just so we can get set up for the use as portion. Thanks everybody for listening for the productive conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Lori. Thank you.